So, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. <clears throat> so, this is the last but one um, seminar for the diploma course, and it's on a subject of hierarchies. We're going to have a look at what hierarchies are and a little bit of what they do and a little bit of how we stand in relation to them. I'm going to start by uh, quoting Manon Blavatsky, it's always a good place to start in Theosophy. And she says on this subject, she says, the whole cosmos is guided, controlled and animated by an almost endless series of hierarchies of sentient beings, each having a mission to perform. They vary infinitely in their respective degrees of consciousness and intelligence. And you can find that in the Secret Doctrine, um, Standard Edition, I think it must be page 274. It seems a simple quote, it's only a few words, but it says, in so few words, it says so much that it's worth looking at in, in, in greater detail. The sentient beings which Madame Blavatsky refers to are commonly called angels. That's what we call them, angels, in the Christian world. Um, in the Eastern world, they would be referred to as devas or divas or shining ones. And Madame Blavatsky is stating as a fact that angels guide, control and even give life to everything that exists. That's some incredible statement, isn't it? Just to say that. But believe me, she doesn't say it out lightly. She knows exactly why she's saying that. She knows exact, exactly how where the sources are that show that to be true right through history and what's more she's telling us that the angels work in hierarchies and that these are so vast in number as to be virtually endless in number endless hierarchies of beings not just a group here and a group there and some there and seven here and seven there we're talking endless hierarchies so she's obviously talking about more than what we would call angels. When she says angels, or when she, she refers to angels, she's talking about an array of beings which is so broad in its scope that it covers everything from the minutiae to the greatest beings in the, in the cosmos. So when we consider the word hierarchies then in, ter in, 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 in terms of theosophy or, or, or spiritual philosophy, we have to realize the vast field in which we, we're using that term. She says that they are sentient, that is that they are conscious, um, varying infinitely in consciousness and intelligence. So she's saying there's a variety of consciousness and intelligence in these hierarchies. From the most profound conscious beings at the highest level, what we would call gods, to the most subservient, if you like, auto auto automatic consciousnesses at the very lowest level of, of existence. And in between those two extremes, there's all different layers of hierarchies who are different in their consciousness and awareness and in their level and degree of intelligence depending on what rank they belong to and what work they do and one other thing she said in that statement is that each of these beings has a specific purpose a mission to perform in creation They've all got a purpose. Every one of those infinite number of beings has an actual purpose, a reason to be, and a, and a duty to perform. You know, when science and philosophers marvel at the intricacies of life, and when you stop and think about it for 
for even a few minutes and you try to imagine what the meaning of life is and the depth of and what you know time makes sense of this incredible universe around you it's not long before you realize that it's so deep that you know it isn't just a chance thing but then the mind behind it must be incredible and these are the minds behind it it isn't God as such a man who says I want this now and I want that now and I'll have that like that and that like that it's these ranks upon ranks of hierarchical beings that actually make life work in all its incredible detail so much detail that we can't fathom it we have also have hierarchies in human affairs don't we hierarchical structures are quite common in life governments are hierarchical they have a prime minister second minister and so on down um, but and you have hierarchies in companies with the managing director and the directors and all the managers and supervisors and then the workers and, but these hierarchies in human life are not um, not of the same order as the hierarchies we're talking about in spiritual terms most human hierarchies are arranged so that certain classes of beings have power over others like the managers have power over the workers and so forth in spiritual hierarchical terms there is no power to be gained by any individual member of a hierarchy it is all done for the common good you don't find that very often in society you may find that in some charities you will find it in nature, you'll find it in bee colonies, ants and wasps and termites and, and, and other animal groupings that work in hierarchical structures and they all work for the good of the whole species. Um, the thing about humans is that we are sort of, um, how can I say this, this is an important point not to put too fine a point on it though we are sort of cut off in awareness conscious awareness terms from this, these hierarchical beings because we don't have any immediate contact with them as generally as a human race whereas the animal kingdom and the vegetable kingdom and the mineral kingdom and the elemental kingdoms all are uh, in, in perfect consort with them it's only when the life waves move to the human kingdom that suddenly we're on our own we, we seem to be alone in this world with only each other for company and most of the time then we can't get on with each other and we arrange hierarchies because it's within nature to be hierarchical but we do that from a point of personal selfish interest and so um, everything else responds to the angelic presence it becomes it, it lives its life within the harmony of creation human beings are cut off from that initially and must refine that connection in order to fill their own purpose the reason why they're cut off is because they certainly have self-conscious awareness and the freedom that comes from free will now you won't find this is why I've said in previous courses uh, in previous talks that you don't find this kind of free will in the animal kingdom or the vegetable kingdom or the other kingdoms because although animals seem to be free to move around and so forth they don't have this freedom to act independently of the whole but human beings do and it's much to our downfall that we do that and most of our pain comes from acting out of, out of harmony with the rest of creation but at one time we were in harmony when we were first human beings right. yes we were still in the bosom of the hierarchical yes. structure and the, uh, the the creative beings were around us commonly aware we were of that but as we became more intelligent shall we say more self-centered we lost that in the same way really that I think you can see the same thing in miniature with a child when a child is first born it is aware of the inner world but as it grows up it gradually becomes more and more isolated but this is part of the progress it is part of the work it's it's the anvil and the, and the, and the hammer and the fire that allows us to build character and to overcome this incredible 
you know, restrictive place called the physical plane and actually bring the spirit into it as individuals rather than as a group. And then as individuals to actually turn back and work as, as a group for the greater good. And you can see that we're still some long way off that stage in human uh, affairs. Some groups in society do work for the greater good. Theosophy is trying to do that, for instance. But mostly in society, human beings tend to work for their family's good, or their own national good, or their own personal good, but not for the good of the whole. So let's have a look at these hierarchies then, at the actual structure. Let's see if we can identify some of these beings from, we've got from the top down. Um, in the beginning of a new cycle of becoming, when the eternal and infinite one life, that's the absolute, turns its inherent force outward into manifestation again, for, for a new creation we could call it, it's then activated, it's, it activates a negative positive polarity which we've talked about before. This brings about a trinity, and its reflection in the manifest worlds, um, this trinity is um, reflected as seven great beings. So if, if you like, you can say, this is a huge divine flame who, whose reflection has seven rays of light coming from it. These are qualities of being. And, and um, in, in other talks, in other places, you'll get a lot more information on those seven rays. Um, these are the Dhyani Buddhas. In Theosophy, the term is used Dhyani Buddha. You don't get, you know, concerned about these terms. It doesn't matter if you, if you just think of it as a Buddha. <laughs> or the Christians have their own name, they call them powers. But they're just names. Basically, the three become seven. The one becomes two, the two become three, and the three becomes seven. And that, those seven enter the manifest world and start the whole of manifestation off. And in theosophical literature, in the Eastern terminology, they're called Dhyani Buddhas. And they are spiritual essences in the primary spectrum. They're the cause of all the other effects. They are the cause of every other effect. So every effect was caused originally by them, filtering down through the plains and over the millennia. It is from these that all else will proceed. There are the seven pure essences of the Absolute. You could think of them as like, an analogy would be like, like as the clouds. And from those clouds, raindrops descend. The clouds don't come down, they coalesce into raindrops. And it is they who express the fundamental laws of becoming, thereby causing all beings, planes, matter, forces, wills, things and futures develop to develop or unfold. We should also try to understand that when we refer to beings we're also referring to qualities because in a, in a, in a one philosophical sense there is no difference between quality and a being. A being is a quality and a quality is a being. So every one of you is a certain quality. Right? In terms of the angelic hosts each one expresses a different quality to its neighbours. These seven Dhyani Buddhas are seven prime qualities we call the seven rays. I'll try and express this a little bit more as we go forward. But we can see how if these seven emanate these qualities we could, try, we could, we could substitute the word quality for vibration. Right? And we could see then that each of those major vibrations could give rise to harmonic vibrations of a, of a different but related type. And each of those could give rise to other harmonic vibrations. 
So it's said in certain literature that in the beginning was the word, and that word vibrates through space, and it differentiates and, 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 and reverberates on itself and causes harmonics, and, and the whole scale of being comes into being. That's one way of looking at it. Because it's only an analogy, it's just some food for thought really. But as this creation then proceeds from these seven, rank upon rank of angels unfold or emanate from within one another. So each vibration gives rise to others, and each of those gives rise to others. Or each quality as inherent within it, or the qualities which then become manifest. Or each being unfolds other beings from within it. But this is why I asked you to consider beings as qualities. as the same thing, because it's hard to see a being giving rise to another being unless that being is pregnant and giving rise to a baby. But that's a reflection of that process at the physical level. If beings do give rise to other beings even at this level. Women give birth to children. If that were not so, we wouldn't have bodies to occupy. But at the cosmic level, they unfold from within each other. A bit like Russian dolls, where there's one inside another, one inside another. They sort of um, emanate. It's another good way to look at it. They emanate. So rank upon rank of angels unfold or emanate one from within another. In terms of a cosmos, a galaxy, or solar system, all of the designated space of that is filled with them. In one sense, it is correct to say that what we call space is angelic presence. So this is another way to look at space, isn't it? Science is busy now looking at space, trying to identify dark matter and dark energy because these are theory, theories for to fill the gap. It's identified all sorts of matter but it realizes out in space there's too many gaps. If you look at the distance between the, the planets that's the kind of gap proportion we're talking about. The same distances between the particles, electrons and so forth of an atom. What's in all the gaps? Science realizes this not long ago, that you could, can't have a gap of nothing, it doesn't work. You have nothing, you're stuck. If there was nothing between here and my home, how would I get home? I can't go through nothing, can I? There has to be material between here and home for me to travel from one point to another. There has to be material in this room for my voice to reach your ears. There has to be a carrier wave for the signal of your TV and radio to be transmitted along. Otherwise it would just disperse. You wouldn't get your coronation tree. So science realized, okay, what we thought was empty space has got to be something else. It's got to be something in there. You can't find it. You can't think what that could be. Because all the space that they can recognize, they can say one thing about it. Quality is light. It's visible by light. No light, no vis visibility. But all the particles they see are all seeable because of light, or they emanate light. Electromagnetic spectrum and all the rest of it. But in the gaps in between, there is no light. Nothing happening. So they come up with the term dark matter. Instead of light matter, there must be dark matter then. But it doesn't get us very far, does it, saying dark matter? It's... it's a It'll do for now. It's work in progress. In another 10 years, you hear a Horizon program on the television and say, what scientists should call dark matter is actually this, that and the other. We've seen it now, we know what it is, it does this and it does the other. But in the meantime, dark matter will cover it. And because it moves about as well, there's an element of movement in it, we'll call that dark energy. In terms of a cosmos, a galaxy, or a solar system, all of the designated space is filled with rank upon rank of angels. Apart from being dark matter, they're light matter of the highest order, aren't they? But they're beyond the spectrum that we view in the physical world. 
So I really like that. I really like the idea that all space is filled with angelic presence. That makes me feel quite cosy, really. It's like the difference between living at the North Pole all on your own, with just a wilderness of white outside you, and living in a nice countryside with, with the neighbours here and there and people to go and see and family. They're everywhere. So in any given space, any plane or any reality, it is the angelic forces that build, give life to and maintain everything from start to the finish. From the start to the finish. There's no angelic activity, there is nothing there. There's nothing. But there's life, there's angelic activity from the start of that life to the very end of that life. We can easily understand the process of unfolding whereby great beings unfold from within themselves, lesser beings, who in turn unfold still more and so on, by seeing them all as qualities or forces, as I said. At the highest level of the spiritual purity, the forces cover a full spectrum of energy patterns made up of countless qualities. Their nature is all-containing. I like that, all-containing. Contains everything. And we can see that any complex quality or extensive spectrum of energy can express aspects of less complex arrangements of its qualities and vibrations. And these compositions can express less dynamic aspects and so on. Now, we'll use an image of an orchestra to see this more clearly. We all know what an orchestra is, we all know how it works, we listen to them. While being one thing, an orchestra, it is composed of several sections, such as string, brass, woodwind and so on. And these sections contain many individual instruments. In order for the orchestra to produce music, it must function as a cohesive whole, a unity. But each section must also function as a unity playing its collective part in harmony and time with the whole. Furthermore, each instrument needs to be played individually and in tune and time with the whole. And finally, the soloist must be capable of standing out from that unity but in such a way as to enhance the overall effect or bring the melody alive within it. The whole performance, creation, must work in perfect harmony key and timing and this is only possible when all the musicians know their instruments to perfection and know the score as a whole and their individual parts within it therefore an orchestra needs a musical score and a conductor and it needs players experience with working in hierarchical arrangement what some call God or unity or the one life can be likened to the composer the score is the divine plan or evolution. The conductor is the divine mind. And the angelic hosts make up the orchestra. The sections are the great beings, the Buddhas, the Manus, the archangels, overseeing the cycles of becoming in the seven planes. The instruments are the lesser angels, the builders, the workers at all levels of creation. And the section leaders are the life waves manifesting as the kingdoms from elemental to human. The soloists are the creatures, the individual lives, and, their, and the highest, the greatest, most accomplished of these are the masters of wisdom, the adepts of humanity. I think that analogy is very fitting because it shows us that life must have this plan, this score, this musical arrangement, and it must be conducted. And Blavatsky is saying that it's these hierarchies of angelic beings that, that, that hold this plan, manifest it as themselves, as qualities of themselves, and conduct the whole thing from beginning to end. And all the creatures that, that are manifest within the creation, like us and the mice and the bees and the birds and the vegetables, and, are, are all... Little, little soloists in their own right trying to fit into that wonderful um, orchestral arrangement. When it comes to man, we go out of tune. <laughs> <laughs> and our job is to find that, list that note 
that note of harmony in the universe, find it within yourself, identify it outside of yourself, and get in line with it. When that happens, the whole of life becomes magical, it becomes a symphony, a beautiful symphony of creation. And you become a wonderful harmonic note weaving through it. Uh, other analogies have been used such as tapestries and the weave and the weft and the warp of the different threads. It all amounts to the same thing. There is a harmony out there, in here, through here, and we are the only ones who disturb that harmony. But we must find that harmony, and in so doing, we will become conductors in our own right. Not just parts of it, but conductors of it in future. That's the beauty of this course of evolution that we're on. So everything that comes into manifestation, whether it's an atom or, or whatever, come, does so only at the only at the action of forces that are expressions of beings, nothing more, expressions of beings. Therefore we can see that the greater the thing, the greater the force, and therefore the greater the being involved. Cosmic things such as galaxies, star systems, um, are brought into manifestation, manifestation and overseen by cosmic beings. Cosmic things, cosmic beings. It makes no difference whether we call these beings Archangels, Manus or Logos, unless we wish to keep within a particular system in terms of reference, they are all angels of one designation or another and all work within their respective hierarchy, which is an expression of their power. The term angel is not a specific one. It doesn't express any specific um, order. When we use a, a particular name, such as uh, Michael or Gabriel or whoever, we're actually talking about not an individual, but a, 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 a rank of hierarch a hierarchical rank, uh, a kind of um, um, it's a collective. So the Archangel Angel Michael, though presided upon by a great being at the height of the, the, the spiritual creation, um, is a whole lineage um, of angels under that <coughs> ray, under that quality. So Michael has a different quality to Gabriel and so forth. And we, again, we're back to these seven qualities, aren't we? Now, a very strange thing that we need to get our head around um, is how each of these ranks of beings is aware of the others. Um, because it's a hierarchical structure, um, there's a definite order of consciousness. I'll give you an example. I'll try and run through an example off the top of my head. Um, the human body, the human being, its constitution from spirit right down to physical body is a hierarchical structure, because everything is. Now in terms of a human being, if you start with his body, the very atoms at the basic level of his vehicle are conscious in their own right. Every atom is conscious at the atomic level. Atoms though, group together to form molecules. When they do so, the atoms must conform to the design of the molecule, but they don't understand what a molecule is. But the molecule understands what an atom is because it's, it's organizing them. Similarly, the molecules are grouped together to form cells. They know what to do because the cell informs them. So the cell knows what the molecules are doing, the molecules know what the atoms are doing, but neither does two know what the cell's doing. And the cells come together to form tissue. And the tissues form organs. At the end of the day, the life force, the consciousness, which is the collective consciousness of an organ, is aware of its purpose 
and carries out its purpose in perfect order to the something goes wrong with it, which involves tissue, cells, molecules and atoms. Similarly now, if you think of all the organs in your body, do they know what you are? Does the collective consciousness of your liver understand Beryl or John or Eric? Oh, but Beryl, John and Eric know they've got a liver and they know what it's made of and they know what it does. So you're getting to see that the consciousness of these hierarchical ranks is, is a way in a downward direction. Now, in terms of our inner life, our spiritual self knows all about what we're up to, but we don't know very much about our spiritual self, do we? Now, in the whole of creation, this is the case. Again, when it comes to man, there's a special point that's crossed. With man, mankind, man, I don't mean man, man as opposed to women, mankind, humans are capable, and they have it within them, to be conscious in both directions. We can be conscious if we so work ourselves in awareness terms and spiritual terms, we can be conscious of the high inner levels of reality. Just as we're conscious of, of the denser levels of our reality in our physical body. We are unique in that. Now, in the Course of Material, you will have found that it says, where is man in this hierarchical structure of the universe, of creation? In all these hierarchies, right down to the atom, where is man? And man is right at the very centre. It's at the centre because in man there is a perfect meeting ground between spirit and matter where the two can be perfectly balanced and that's within you, within me. Most of us are not in that state of course because we've still got to realise that there's a harmony to the universe. When we get into that harmony though we bring it to balance both spirit and matter within ourselves. And that is, leads then to our perfection and to be, being self-consciously divine, so aware of our own divinity. So angels are always in conscious unity with the whole. But the purpose is understood in a downward direction. So as each rank of, of angels um, unfolds, they, have, they know their purpose. And they unfold other beings who also know their purpose and so on. But nevertheless, whilst they only know the purpose in that progression, they are conscious of the whole. But that's like, that's like saying, you know, I'm conscious of the whole, everybody in this room, but I don't know everybody's purpose. <laughs> but I'm aware of you all. So man is the very key to the whole process because he stands at the very centre of the hierarchy of creation. In man, spirit and matter, the two prime opposites, meet and are able to be held in perfect balance. Man's great problem, that which causes him so much pain, is that he must come to understand that balance and attain it, thereby expressing the perfection of a being in perfect harmony, something that only man can do. Lovatsky said that, Every spirit is either a disembodied or a future man. So here she goes again, she makes an incredible statement. Every spirit is either a disembodied or a future man. What are we to make of that? In order to become divine, a fully conscious God, even the highest spiritual intelligence, must pass through the human stage. But human does not apply only to our own physical condition. 
the term human is applied to us because of our central position but it would easily apply to someone in a previous system who would never had a physical plane at all as long as that being is at the central point of that system where the two extremes of that system can be balanced in that being that is a designation of a human being so some of the Dain Chohans and the Buddhas and, and the, these divine beings, these angelic beings have been human in that sense very few of them, if any, have been human in the physical sense that again makes us, in this particular system, rather unique so you can be called human even though you never had a physical body because the system you were in only came as low as the astral plane but you were in a position that was dead central to the spectrum of that system so you could balance out both opposites of that system and come into harmony in that system in the lunar chain which is the chain before us the lunar petries achieved that balance in the solar chain before that it was the solar petries who achieved that balance that was at the mental level they never came anywhere near the physical level but they're designated as human that is standing equally between two manus or the opposites of a system that's what we call and we are humans because we're in that position here and our lowest point is the physical plane and our highest point is the um, atomic plane At each stage in the manifestation of the universe, the hierarchies of angelic orders of divine beings emerge to oversee the various aspects, including our solar logos, whose outer vehicle is the sun that gives us our life and gives life to all the planets. The planets are expressions of planetary spirits working under the direction of the solar logos himself, and our own earth is the body of a mighty being that sustains the life of every living entity on earth. It is within her divine consciousness that we have our hierarchical position in the earth scheme. So these hierarchies of beings, these angels, they're not just fluttery things that we can think of as angels shining up there in the spiritual realm somewhere. It's right down to planets are hierarchical beings. They're angelic beings. But they're angelic beings of an incredible order imagine you know you are, are the um, embodiment of a vehicle of consciousness that accommodates billions of lives within it even your bloodstream is teeming with lives you you are the master of you determine what happens to it it's living they're all living and having their life within you and on you but the being that is our planet has not only the lives that are within you but those that are in me, you, everybody else in the, in, in, on the earth and all the animals and all the billions of lives within their bodies and in, within their inner being and all the vegetables and all the minerals and all the atoms and all the elementals this being we call the earth mother is responsible for all that myriad of life it's bad enough to think that I'm responsible for all these what would it be like to be a planet and be responsible for all, all the, and it, it, when you say responsible I mean responsible to, for, for, for making it possible and overseeing and controlling and guiding the evolution of all these beings because every little tiny atom has to evolve and it's up to the Earth Mother to see that that happens over time or at least that, that w what happens during her manifestation period proceeds according to the plan and then if you go beyond that to the solar system itself of which she is only one member then you've got the solar Logos who is, who, whose body is so powerful <coughs> That it gives off an incredible blinding light. This uh, its body of 
is a nuclear reactor, basically, times a million. Think of that, the kind of consciousness that, that has a vehicle which is like 50 billion nuclear reactors. Because without that, none of these planets could sustain life. And it is shining out into space, into the cosmos, and other cosmic beings can see it. They're its neighbours. Like you and I are now in each other's company, our solar logos is in the company of all the other solar logos in the galaxy. Millions of other suns, which are all incredible, powerful beings giving off this incredible light, sustaining life. You see, when you think of hierarchies, it's much more than just a few angels. And I'm going to finish now, because I think, you know, we've, we've opened up this vista, this is so incredible, we need to chew on this, we need to go away and sort of sit in the bath for three hours, really. You can't expect to get your head around all that. Hierarchies are the very stuff of creation. Everywhere and everything is part of that great symphony of evolving life that is the means of the emerging, the becoming of gods without number. Gods without number. Thank you. Does anybody want to uh, say anything now? Ask anything now? That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, 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 no. I don't, I don't say. That was great. <laughs> okay, you can put that off then, Julie, because I don't know.